Good morning, everyone, and I'm pleased to now introduce a special panel discussion hosted by the Westminster Kennel Club called Shaping the Future Together, How Breeders Can Help Scientists Better Understand Basic Breed Biology. Both Embark and the Westminster Kennel Club are committed to promoting the importance of canine health. Embark and Westminster have actually long partnered to create and deliver educational content to breeders the world over about how genetic health is an important component of overall canine health and how genetic health testing can be used to support healthy breeding programs. Today's panel discussion adds to this important collaboration and will explore how breeders' expertise and understanding of their breeds can help scientists better understand breed biology and aid in future discoveries to advance canine health. Please join me in now welcoming the moderator for this panel, Gail miller Beischer. Welcome, Hello, Gail. John. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Yes, yes. Excited to have you host this discussion. And for, uh, for everyone's uh, reference about Gail, I have a, a great bio for you here. Um, Gail miller Beischer is the Westminster Kennel Club's Director of Communications, spokesperson, and on-air analyst for its iconic dog show. Gail is an AKC licensed dog show judge and is a member of the Dog Writers Association of America, as well as multiple national breed clubs. She is passionate about dogs and an advocate for canine health, and she brings a wealth of experience from years working with dog owners, breeders, handlers, and from helping to produce one of the world's foremost canine sporting events. Originally from Bearded Collies, she is currently the proud owner of a Vishla and an English Cocker Spaniel. So, Gail, welcome again, and thank you for moderating the discussion. Thanks, John. It's going to be a lot of fun. For sure, for sure. So now I'm really excited to be here and ready to introduce our panel. Um, we have some great panelists lined up, and I believe they're going to be joining now. I'm going to let each person introduce themselves, and I will uh, start it off with um, Larry Lecce, DVM. He's the owner and breeder of Flynn, the Bichon Frise, who was the 2018 Westminster Best in Show winner. So he'll kick it off for us. Uh, go ahead, Larry. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Larry Lecce. I am a small animal veterinarian in the state of Michigan. And the majority of my practice includes um, working with breeders and helping them to get the best outcome for their dog. I've also been a breeder, well, along with my wife, uh, Lori Carlton of Bashan Frise uh, for the last 40 years. And I'm also, uh, we've also had the pleasure of showing dogs and finishing dogs in all the groups except for carriers. Great, and next up, is Zach Lonsberry, who's with uh, Embark. He's the Embark product analyst and a research scientist. Go ahead, Zach. Thanks very much. Um, really happy to be here also. Um, just a little bit about me. I got my graduate degree from Kansas State about a decade ago and uh, spent most of the time after that working with UC Davis in a wildlife genetics and genomics context. Um, so I'm you know, kind of working with everything from foxes to albatrosses to uh, North American wolf like canids, which kind of got me interested in dogs. And so spent a little bit of time at the vet genetics lab there and then came out here as a bioinformatics scientist about two years ago and have just been kind of helping with all matters of scientific support since then. So thanks very much. Great. And our third panelist is Lisa Peterson. She is an Embark senior content strategist in the Breeder Veterinarian Group. Go ahead, Lisa. Hi, Gail. Thanks. So my background is um, a lot of work with AKC over the years. I'm a 35-year breeder owner handler of Norwegian elk hounds. Um, I've also uh, become a delegate for my parent club. I've also <laughs> worked for AKC for many years as their communications director and spokesperson. I've also done some work with Westminster as a PR consultant. So I'm uh, really uh, happy to be here today to share um, my knowledge of all those years. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa. Welcome, all of you. Uh, we're going to go ahead and kick it off with Zach. Zach, can you give us um, a brief overview of what breed biology is so that we kind of know where we're starting from here today? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, in many ways, breed is often used by owners and veterinarians as sort of a proxy for genetic testing. 
Uh, we know that within certain breeds, they're prone to exhibiting unique traits, health conditions, behaviors, those sort of things. And the extent to which those things are heritable is largely like presumed to be understood across individual breeds. And so genetic testing goes a little bit of a step further and sort of seeks to understand the genetic mechanisms underlying these traits and behaviors, uh, allowing us, uh, allowing <laughs> breeders rather, to make sort of more informed decisions uh, towards breeding their best dogs. And so when we talk about breed biology, we're really sort of referring to that population level genetic characteristics resulting from those hundreds of years, or sorry, hundreds of generations of artificial selecting for sort of what makes your breed your breed. Leave your muted. There we go. Larry, as a breeder, you know there are certain genes connected with breed type, temperament, and health, and even performance. Uh, but because we can't see the genotype of some of the traits we want, we may have to rely on the phenotype of certain traits when making breeding decisions. Can you take us through what it's like to plan a litter of Bichons that includes the best in show winner, uh, like Flynn? but both genotypically and phenotypically? Well, I've always said that breeding is part science, part art, and uh, a lot of luck. Um, and if, I think it's very important that whoever is going to start a breeding program, that the most important thing that they can do is understand what the breed type is. Um, in our particular case, a Bichon Frise, is known for being a companion animal, but uh, to a lot of people's surprise, they were one of the original circus dogs in um, England and in France in the Renaissance area at times. And so they have to also be a very athletic dog. Um, you also have to look at the history of the particular breed to get some understanding. In our particular case, when the, the breed first came over in the 1960s, we had a different breed than we have today. They had a tendency to be a little bit longer, a little bit lower on leg, and they also had a longer coat um, related to their cousins, the Maltese. As time has gone along, phenotypically, we've changed that uh, breed to be a little bit more up on leg and a double-coated dog, which shows that, that nice powder puff uh, type of aspect that you see like in Flynn and the dogs that are showing today. So I think all of those is, are factors that go into your breeding program. And then the next most important thing I think that we all need to worry about is what are the, the genetic um, things that are important to your particular breed when you're starting your breed program? In our particular case, um, there are some basic things that need to be done, such as you know the, the, the normal OFA testing um, of hips, elbows, knees, uh, we have them checked by a veterinary ophthalmologist before they're bred. And we also um, have their heart certified by a cardiologist. So when you're talking about the genetic aspect of all of that, that all plays into it. Uh, we also recommend, you know, definitely doing um, breeding soundness exams. And a very important part of that uh, is, is temperament. Uh, and if something does not have the proper temperament, uh, you know, it might be a little bit shyer, it might be a little bit more laid back. We will possibly eliminate that from our breeding program because uh, we don't want to necessarily um, have that be an issue when we're breeding a litter of dogs. Um, that also goes a long way for determining, you know, how we place our puppies. If we're looking for an athletic dog, an agility dog, which Bichons are doing a lot of, we will, um, try to get that dog into that particular home. Um, show dogs like Flynn. Um, Flynn was the brat of the litter. Um, Flynn just stood out like a sore thumb compared to his sisters. His two sisters were a little bit more laid back. Um, one of his sisters uh, was not even finished because she was definitely the type of dog that wanted to sit on a couch. She was, so we made, the, we made the decision, even though she was beautiful, that spaying her and placing her into a pet home was what was the most important thing for that dog to have, to have a happy quality life. So those are some of the things that we do. And it, it takes years to come to these conclusions. The most important thing that I always recommend to people is observe, observe, watch, learn. Um, don't stick to just your breed when you're looking at dogs. When you go to a dog show, it's important that you learn about all breeds of dogs because that helps with your whole complete knowledge of dogs. And that's sort of how we do a lot of our program um, here at Bell Creek Bichon. 
Yeah, I think that's great advice because the breeds are so different, so unique, and so going to a dog show, like you said, and watching the different breeds and learning about the different breeds is uh, invaluable. Um, speaking of which, Lisa is also a breeder of a very different breed. Um, Lisa, do you have anything else to add or a different angle from your breed, the Norwegian Elkhound? You're muted. Okay, we're, we'll get that. We'll get that. <laughs> Thanks, Gail. So, yes, the Norwegian Elkhound uh, is a, a very different type of breed. It's a hunting breed from Norway. Uh, their original purpose, as they still do today, is to track moose through, uh, you know, miles and miles of rough terrain uh, in inclement weather. So they are a hardy breed, and a lot of their traits are to help them in that condition. Their coat, for example, is very thick. It's a double coat. Um, it has uh, long outer hairs to keep the water away. It's very water repellent, water resistant. Um, they do shed profusely, um, but they also have to have good structure and movement because they are traveling for miles and miles going forward like that. Um, but we try to keep the Norwegian Elkhound as close to possible as its original function. Uh, every year at our uh, national specialties, we bring in judges from Norway who actually hunt uh, with their dogs sometimes, so they can evaluate our dogs as if they were hunting dogs, which I think is pretty cool. Um, but we also, you know, to plan a litter, like Larry said, we take uh, health testing very seriously, both phenotypic types, such as hips and eyes and elbows, um, register them with OFA uh, to hopefully get a chick number on our breeding animals. Also genetic health testing, Norwegian Elkhounds have uh, three specific genetic tests uh, with Embark. They have uh, the dwarfism one, the PRA or the PRCD, and also glaucoma. So it's really important that we do that. I know in the, in the keynote speaker earlier, Dr. Davidson was talking about the pre-breeding exam of bitches as well. So, you know, these are all things we sort of take into account as we get ready to, uh, to breed. But I also, like Larry mentioned, the temperament of the puppies and, you know, where are you going to place them going forward? I always, when I look at a litter of puppies, I say, you know, uh, do I want to keep this dog for myself? Like I look for a dog that's laid back, um, high energy, but also, you know, that's happy to live with in the house. Uh, for example, we had five puppies recently and one of the puppies went to a high energy dog, went to a home with two boys and two alcounds, whereas the laid back male, he's uh, sitting here under my desk right now. But anyway, so yeah, it's a different breed. It's a smaller gene pool. Uh, we have to be a little more careful about genetic diversity. I know Zach later on is gonna be talking about the coefficient of inbreeding and how that can help us to um, increase our genetic diversity as much as we can within a closed gene pool. But uh, yeah, two totally different breeds. Yeah. So um, how is all this information relevant to DNA sample recruitment? Uh, how can breeders help embark with future research? So that's a great question, Gail. I think when we uh, start the journey of a swab, when you're going to genetically test your dog, um, it's more than just the genetic testing that we're looking at. Uh, embark collects data on your dog, both phenotypically and genetically. So uh, once you um, send the swab off to embark, uh, you have an online profile that you can come visit and do things like uh, upload photographs of your dog so we can see what they look like, what the phenotype is. You can also add documents such as um, registration certificates to see, you know, what registry you're registered with, what the breed of dog is. Um, also, pedigrees are really important as well. And, and videos. Videos are a great example of putting in uh, things that might be looked for in the future for behavior traits. For example, let's say your dog has this trait. It, you know, spins around in front of the front door, and it seems to be a very breed-specific sort of trait. You can upload these videos, then say in the future, maybe if we're looking at behavior traits, we can see these videos as proof that this dog does spin, and then look at it deeper, like does it spin to the left, does it spin to the right? So there's, there's all that, but I think the most important thing that happens after you get your dog DNA tested, <coughs> excuse me, is you have to take the annual health survey, which, uh, is a great way to sort of show the progress of your dog as it ages. If your dog develops a disease at a certain age, it might help for the onset 
of that disease. Like if it's a four-year-old that got a certain kind of cancer and we see that over and over again, that would you know, help in discoveries going forward. And just, just to clarify, there's two puppies playing in your house, right? Um, yes, I, <laughs> uh, you can probably hear them. They're growling on the floor. They're going to bark soon. I'm going to mute. I apologize for that. I, I, uh, it's their play hour. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. We're, we're going to throw it out to, to Zach. Zach, what factors does Embark consider when they are selecting research projects? Yeah, I really like this question. Um, so, you know, we've got like all manner of scientists over here uh, kind of doing our own research and digging into the most recent literature and all that sort of stuff. But um, not every health condition receives academic attention. Uh, the conditions that are important in your breed might not be part of a larger study right now. And so in that case, reviewing the literature simply isn't sufficient to catch it. Um, and also, even on its best day, the publication process can be pretty painfully slow. And we know that, you know, you want to be breeding healthier dogs now. And so this is where Embark scientists can kind of really lean on the breeder community to help identify future research projects. And so we ask for things like, what is the type of disorder you're dealing with? What do the clinical diagnosis look like? What is the mode of inheritance? Is it completely penetrant? Do you see it in, you know, every dog in a litter kind of thing? Um, what's the impact on the breeding population? Is it a rare condition? Is it common? Uh, what's the age of onset is extremely important. Um, a lot of times people will test their dogs when they're puppies and then move on, not knowing that they have a condition that's onset later in life. So Lisa referred to the annual health survey. It's a really important thing to, uh, to be paying attention to over the life of the dog. Um, I think most critically is this sort of ability to collect sufficient key samples. These are going to be from dogs that are known to express the trait of interest. Uh, whether it's a health condition, a phenotypic trait, a behavior, something like that. Um, you know, they're able to be sort of diagnosed properly with this condition, uh, and we can get a lot of them. You know, one dog doesn't make a study, uh, while it can certainly be interesting. So it's important to kind of make sure ahead of time that this condition is represented enough in specifically unrelated animals that we can kind of go through and, and help identify the genetic underpinnings of it. Uh, and then, of course, the ability to collect age-matched controls, dogs that don't have that trait. It's also going to be equally important, um, sort of within that breed in particular. Uh, that's, that's good. So uh, some things that we sort of think about on our end once we have all that information is that there's only a certain number of scientists in the world to be doing this sort of work. So we are, you know, resource limited in that regard. Uh, so what's going to make the most impact? What's going to affect the most dogs? what's going to give the most dogs longer, healthier lives. Um, we can even go as far as to ask if there are human health implications. Uh, that's a little bit more down the road. Right now we're primarily focused on, you know, dogs and dog health. Uh, but, you know, that's something that's, that's concerned as well. So, you know, we're talking about things like cancer research and stuff like that. There have been a number of talks uh, talking about that. Um, so yeah, just sort of we're we're looking for impact. We're looking for how we can reach the most dogs with the resources that we have. That's great. That's great and very exciting, right? Because you know there's a huge future. There's places to go. There's so many places to go. So I'm sure um, you all are working very hard uh, there at Embark. <laughs> um, now let's talk to Larry as a breeder and a vet. Uh, Larry, what type of research studies do you think would be valuable to a breeders or vets at owners? Um, and have you seen some in your breeding program or in your breed that might be uh, areas for research or your vet practice recently? Well, our national breed club, the Bashan Fazay Club of America's um, health committee regularly scans um, breeding or um, genetic testing sites and they also um, raise money on a regular basis and then what they will do is they will donate um, finances to the um, particular research project that are problems in our breed. Um, we've had studies uh, in many different places uh, and with some of our breed problems which is um, atopic dermatitis, uh, uh, stones problems in the bladder and and um, cataracts. Uh, so we have some studies going on with all of those. We also do a great amount of um, DNA testing at our national so that we have a 
collection of samples. So if there is a particular study that can come up, would be beneficial for the breed. We do have some DNA, DNA samples that are readily available in order to um, send into wherever the study is being done. Um, the question about uh, what happens in a practice situation, it can be something that just you would never have heard of a particular disease and you have a new breed that's coming in. And you, my job as a veterinarian is, I may not even know that much about a particular disease because there are so many thousands of diseases out there and conditions uh, that we've learned in veterinary school, but things change with time. We will try to research very uh, extensively in order to try and get that person to the particular spot where they can get the answers for their questions. Um, just within the last two weeks, uh, two particular stories that, that come to my mind were uh, my reception is the breeder of Great Danes, and she does uh, color testing and bobtail analysis, which is a DNA sample, which is sent to the University of California, Davis, where they can tell specifically what type of uh, gene characteristics based on a color pattern um, can come forward uh, as of the next generation. And by an analyzing those, she can eliminate uh, the possibility of some of the the, the particular colors. Uh, piebald dog in the Great Dane is something that is not allowed to be shown. And there are some problems with breeding certain um, harlequins to, a, uh, to another harlequin, which can uh, lead to 25% um, of all fetal death uh, within that particular litter. So by not breeding this to that is very important um, in order to help with that. Um, the other thing is uh, we just recently had, and sorry about the ring in the background there, guys. Um, we uh, recently had a uh, veterinary ophthalmologist at our clinic and we had a breeder of a very rare breed of dog here in the United States. They are AKC approved, but she had a litter of three puppies checked uh, that were probably about nine months old. All three of the puppies had a uh, hereditary um, eye disorder that could lead to blindness. She also had the mother checked and the mother was absolutely clear at that particular point. She was so concerned about this that these were the first puppies that she's ever had an issue with that she actually got in contact with the veterinarian at Michigan State University and she's already contacted her breed club and they are starting a study in the next couple of months uh, when her national occurs uh, to try and find the particular marker for this particular eye disease. So those are the sorts of things that you know, we, we find in a, a daily practice in order to help people with the best health for their dogs. That's great. You're making connections, and these connections are fortunately happening more and more frequently. So that's awesome. That's great to hear. Uh, Lisa, I know there was a recent study um, about the discovery of early onset adult deafness in Rhodesian Ridgebacks. Um, can you tell us how clubs can get studies done with Embark? Sure, yeah, the, um, the recent Rhodesian Ridgeback discovery um, was a, a decade-long collaboration between breeders and owners and research scientists, and eventually Embark uh, came to help bring it over the finish line to find a test for uh, testing for that early onset deafness in Rhodesian Ridgebacks. And I think the key for this type of study is that it really does take a lot of samples to, to get a study done. Like Zach said, one sample does not make a study. Uh, the numbers that were used in the Rhodesian Ridgeback study were 23 affected dogs and 162 control Rhodesian Ridgebacks. So clubs can apply for um, inquiry, it's called. We have a form that I will share uh, in the chat. If you want to look me up after this session, I'm in the chat. I can send you a link to it. Um, I'll also be in the uh, Embark booth at the end of the day at 3 o'clock if you want to reach me there to send you a link to this research inquiry form. But basically, clubs need to do a little bit of homework to be considered for study. Uh, like Larry was talking about all the things that the Bichon Club of America is doing. Um, you know, you really have to be able to get a suitable number of samples to have a study, to have access to the dogs that have both the condition and clear dogs as well, as well as older dogs. Um, you, you might want to think as a club, do you think you know the genetic cause? Uh, can you see a familial a correlation between dogs that have the disease and don't have the disease. What's also important is the age of onset. So do you know these dogs get this condition at say age five or age seven or later in life? 
Um, if there is any known research, certainly share it. I know our Embark scientists are very cutting edge and out there reading all the literature and looking for uh, all the diseases that affect dogs today. But basically, you can bring Embark a package for consideration. And to Zach's point, you know, we will take a look at that. If the study is accepted, um, it's good to know that the, um, the cost to the club or the breeders involved in the study is, is free. Everything is free. There's no additional cost. We will give you free swabs for additional sample recruitment. Uh, all the samples will be confidential. We use barcodes that is everything is anonymous so that it's, um, you know, we're very sensitive to clubs and breeders for this purpose as well. So, and also uh, the more the clubs can package this and bring it together, uh, it would also help bring us novel discoveries sooner than say with the Rhodesian Ridgebacks that took 10 years. Thanks, Lisa. You know, I think Embark calls them bark codes, not barcodes. So <laughs> <laughs> I think that's really cute. But you know what? It, this recruitment really empowers the breeders to uh, give them another way to really help their breed health in the future by by just a quick little cheek swab. You really can can make a you know a donation of sorts to uh, to make the research come to life, and that's um, that's. That's great. I love that the breeders are now, you know, have even more skin in the game and can really help make a difference. But it is a numbers game, as, as Zach said. We need lots of, lots of swabs. So, um, Zach, genetic diversity we know is very important to health at the individual and breed levels. Um, as a population geneticist, can you give us an overview of the benefits of using genetic COI versus pedigree based? COI calculations? Yeah, so this is a conversation I've been having with breeders for years now, um, both myself and, and through other folks. And if you didn't check out uh, Dr. Sam Hauser's talk yesterday, she goes into great detail about COI and how we test for it and why you should use it. And nothing that I can say in the next handful of minutes is going to do that talk justice. So I would absolutely recommend going and checking it out. But I can give some cliff notes in the meantime. And so the one thing that I really like to emphasize when talking about this is, is that pedigrees always have founders. And the specific inbreeding within those founders is not always known. It's often inferred, but there are a lot of pedigrees that go back pretty deeply, you know, even dozens of generations, but they always make that underlying assumption that at the very top of that pedigree, those individuals are unrelated. And so that's why pedigree COI tends to be an underestimate in some cases, right? This isn't always going to be the case. but you know, the breeders know their breed. They often know the dogs that their breeds are founded from. That's great context and that's great information. But not everybody knows that. And occasionally pedigree mishaps happen and, and things like that. There's documentation errors throughout the history of the breed. Um, these things are rare, but they're good to know. And genetic COI sort of gets that agnostic of paperwork. Um, the genetic COI doesn't isn't affected by clerical errors. You know, it really just gives you a nice internal estimate within a single dog, how much of their genome is identical by descent, how much of it they share sort of with their, their founding animals. Um, and so it's just a really powerful tool to sort of circumvent some of the problems associated with the paperwork, the, the pedigree keeping. Um, and, and another thing that I think is really important to call out is that the relatedness of dogs to one another is what sort of determines the COI of their litter. And so if dogs themselves are very inbred, but they're not related to each other at all, uh, your dogs, despite the parents having a high coefficient of inbreeding, your dogs are actually going to be relatively low COI, which is a good thing. Um, similarly, you can have two dogs with zero COI, but they came from the same litter. They're full siblings. And so the COI of their uh, litters are going to approximate like 25%. And so, you know, really understanding the dynamic between the parents and their internal inbreeding and how that relates relative to the larger population is really critical in, in understanding this. And Embark's got some tools uh, for breeders to actually explicitly do this, which is really nice. That's a recent release. Um, but I just, I can't emphasize enough that all pedigrees have founders and those founders do, all dogs are related to some degree relatively recently. And so, you know, there's always some, some internal COI at play that genetic COI can help us get around. Great, thanks, Zach. Um, we're about half an hour in and we have a lot of questions coming in. 
So I say, yeah, take a sip. I think we're going to move on to some of the questions. And the first one, Zach, is for you, so we'll just keep you on a roll here. All right. Some Portuguese water dogs carry the contraplasia mutation, CDDY, but it appears that this gene has infrequent penetrance in this breed. This is the first dominant mutation the breed is dealing is with, and we need both information on incidence of this mutation as well as frequency of expression to guide breeding decisions. Can you make this part of your questionnaire and separate out our breed for study? Yeah, that is an excellent question and very well phrased. Thank you. Um, that the, the thing that I'll emphasize is that there are a lot of dog breeds and not a lot of people able to craft and handle service. Um, we do our best to make sure that we're getting feedback from the entire breeder community and, and like I said, prioritizing that to the best of our ability. Um, so I, I would definitely put you in touch with customer support who would to put you in touch with the sort of sample recruitment folks because these are exactly the types of things we want to be answering. Um, I hope that was a sufficient answer. I don't actually have, I'm not a medical professional, I'm a population geneticist, so I can't really speak to uh, a lot of the details there. But uh, yeah, hope, hopefully just sort of emphasizing that we want to make every condition that's important to your breed part of our process and part of our product. And so definitely continue to reach out and reach out through official channels so that we've got it, you know, documented and we've got sample sizes and these sorts of things that we can start to make decisions on. Great. Thank you. So this next question from one of our viewers, um, I'm throwing out to everybody. Uh, Zach, you may be able to start it, but I think Larry and Lisa may want to chime in as well. So, so feel free. Um, for non-breeding individuals, is there any merit to genome sense sequencing for individuals that are not intact or neutered, such as those acquired from rescues. Hopefully, um, let's see, hopefully that makes sense, she says, or he says, uh, he says, uh, like for long-term studies or just better understanding of trends for breeds. Uh, I will jump into the very beginning of that uh, and, and hopefully get sort of a larger conversation going with the other panelists. Uh, one of the things I learned when I embarked my mutt. So I have a, a mutt that I rescued, little chihuahua mix, and I've got a purebred greyhound. And my mutt has a considerably higher COI than my purebred greyhound, which often surprises people. Um, there are things like that that you can learn about your rescue dogs, things like whether or not they have an MDR1 variant that makes them resistant to certain drugs, or you know, things that are actually important to the health of the individual animal. And taking a step even beyond that, hopefully we can look into um, how to sort of take the individual parts of mixed breed dog genomes and sort of treat them as localized purebreds, for lack of a better way to phrase it. And that would increase sample size dramatically um, and sort of help sort of guide some of these um, discoveries as well. But I can kick it over to the other panelists if, if they have anything to add there. Larry, do you I would to say, that? yes, I think of something that might help with that is um, the correlation between your breed, your national breed club and your rescue aspect of a particular pure, purebred dog. A lot of the dogs that um, come into the Bacham Grise Club of America's rescue program um, actually have a health condition. Um, a lot of them are turned in for skin issues. They are turned in for bladder stones that the, the owner can't afford to um, have that surgery done. Some are turned in, you know, unfortunately for the way people, you know, his lives are and, and stuff. We get a lot of dogs that are between the 10, between the ages of 10 and 16 that have a health issue. And those dogs are valuable um, genetically to understand the particular disease. And by having that DNA sample come through the rescue program, um, I think that adds into all the stuff that Zach said about, um, you know, uh, the more uh, number of samples you have, the better it is. So those are actually very important dogs for a study on those dogs that are coming into the rescue program. 
Interesting. That's interesting that it's, uh, well, it's always sad to me that it's the senior dogs that when they become expensive and not as fun that they sometimes are, are um, given up. But um, I, I think that sounds like a great idea. Lisa, do you have any um, experience with the Elk Hound Club and Rescue? Are there a lot of, it's a smaller club. Are there, uh, is there a large rescue arm with the Elk Hound Club? So there, are, there is. There's a, we have a, a rescue arm with our national parent club, and then we also have regional clubs that run their own. Um, I'm sorry, I was hearing an echo. So um, yeah, we do, but we don't get a lot of dogs in through rescue. Uh, but I think I was just thinking about what Zach said about dogs, and it makes me think of the dog uh, in the Ronin discovery. His name was Bogey, and he was um, an Australian cattle dog, and he happened to have a uh, did not have the Ronin gene. And so he was uh, a rescue dog, I believe, and his owners uh, didn't believe he was a purebred dog based on his T DNA test. But then when we were looking for the Ronin gene, having his uh, photograph to see that he did not carry the Ronin gene became very valuable. So I think you know any dog anywhere uh, can contribute to the DNA database, whether they're purebred or rescue. Um, older dogs are especially valuable. Um, you know, like I said earlier about uh, onset of diseases, because uh, you just you just never know. You never know what dog is um, keeping that one little secret gem that needs to be discovered. Right. And just as a reminder to people who may not be familiar, you know, the breeds, all breeds have a parent club, a national breed club, and almost all of those 200 plus clubs have a rescue arm. And so there are going to be um, dogs that can be rehomed, and uh, if you're looking for a purebred dog that, uh, but you don't want a puppy necessarily, or you feel that you want to adopt, reaching out to one of those national breed clubs is, uh, is a great way to start looking for that dog. And then get their cheek swab. Um, <laughs> all right, let's go on to the next question. Uh, let's see, I breed Shih Tzus. Will there ever be a test to determine if they will throw puppies with hernias that are not caused by the umbilical cord, fading away syndrome, and nasopharyngeal caudal? I may have gotten that wrong. Sorry, Zach. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I, um, I, I think the one of the trickiest things when talking about breed biology in general is what is heritable and what is not. And so there are sometimes things that through incomplete penetrance or similar seem to be heritable to a degree that they aren't or, or something similar. Genetics is complicated uh, is, is sort of the, the big take home of this. Um, and we're trying to make it less complicated. It's a work in progress. But in, in some cases, as far as like, will we be able to test for a specific test? Will we be able to discover a specific test? Uh, it sort of all loops back to what Lisa was talking about, just getting, getting like sort of a proper, <clears throat> excuse me, formal study in place. Uh, where we can actually start to look to see if these things even are heritable at all, um, at, or the extent to which you know it's epigenetic or there's something else going on. So it's it's definitely like we keep throwing every idea you have towards our sample recruitment teams, and and we we want to think about all of this all the time. And then um, I can answer little... Oh, go ahead, Larry. Yes, please. Okay. Um, I can say a little bit from the veterinary aspect um, of some of these things. When we have a person that comes in with uh, their puppies fading, um, when they come in with either an umbilical or an inguinal hernia, uh, as some of these things that this uh, individual's question is, you have to look at not only the genetics, but you have to look at the environmental aspect of it. You have, also have to look at... Um, you know, the nutritional aspect of it. So the genes are extremely, extremely important, but you also have to clarify the whole entire environmental aspect of it, the, uh, and, you know, the nutritional aspect of it. And I think that uh, I agree with Zach on the genetic parts of it. It's kind of hard to pinpoint a specific, and that's the hardest part is pinpointing a specific problem to a specific genetic disorder, you have to look at the entire picture in order to, to, to solve those problems for the individual breeder. Thanks, Larry. Um, all right, we have another um, viewer who has sent a question. 
Are there any Embark updates on the Lotus Syndrome, aka FNAD, in puppies study in puppy study in Silken Windhouse? Not sure you're going to know that specifically, Zach, what the status is, but. Um, that's uh, the, uh, I would probably advocate for not relying on me to answer those questions <laughs> as far as specific studies go. Uh, we're working on a lot and it, it's a lot to keep in my head. So um, yeah. I don't have an answer for that offhand, but I bet our customer support folks do. Great. All right. Well, here's a more general question. How long does it take to make a discovery? Like, what's the process, and what are you what are you excited about? Um, I would say <clears throat> that it totally depends on the mutation. It totally depends on the as as a scientist, my answer is very regularly. Well, it depends um, because we could stumble across something. Um, Roan is a good example. It certainly took like the whole academic process, which is is definitely not an overnight process. Um, but it was, you know, as far as scientific discoveries go, relatively quick. Um, these things often just take something coming to a scientist's attention and the right models being put in place to test those hypotheses. Um, it, you know, it, it would be lovely if I could say three weeks. Um, but it's definitely a more than three weeks and be often not quite that simple. Uh, Lisa called out that the Rhodesian Ridgeback uh, onset or adult ah, words, um, the deafness study uh, was going on for about 10 years plus uh, before we sort of got got in there. So some of these things can definitely take a while. Um, but the more samples we collect and the closer we can work with breed clubs, we can get that number shorter and shorter. And that's one of our major goals here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oops. Oh, shoot. Hold on. It says, here we go. Another lab offers a test that you don't. Why might that be? Is it a publication thing? Uh, we test with a research grade microarray, which uh, cannot test every type of genetic variant. There are models that we can put together using the variants that we can test for. But in some cases, things like copy number variants and things like uh, multi, uh, things that require more than one gene, um, these are more difficult to test on the type of test that we have. Uh, there are also some uh, legal things and embargoes on tests that I don't understand because I don't speak legalese, but uh, the, the folks here do, so I, I can uh, certainly kick that back to them. Uh, but definitely, uh, yeah, I think that's actually probably all I have to say on that. Okay, thanks. Um, here's something that's interesting, and I think everyone here has seen this in the show ring and in the field. Someone is asking about discoveries that show a different percentage in field dogs versus bench dogs, show dogs, in a given breed. So, we're always very proud when there's a top winning show dog that also is a champion in the field um, to just kind of prove that they can still do what they do. But you also have some breeds where the lines really go different directions and the field people just breed the dogs that they use in the field and don't use the show dogs. Do you know if there is a, um, a difference genetically that, that has been studied? Uh, do either of the breeders want to provide some perspective there before I talk sure. too much? Sure, I can I can talk to that. So um, to your point, Gail, you know, working lines and show lines sometimes start to uh, diverge from each other and they become almost their own gene pools, if you will. So there is definitely um, a good reason to, to study both of those lines. But I, I also want to just bring up a point about that. Uh, when looking to increase your genetic diversity in your breeding program, that sometimes you can go over to a working line of the same breed and you can get that genetic diversity back into your own breeding program uh, rather than just staying within the show line. Uh, I know it's very hard to find new genetic material within closed populations, but this is a perfect example of how um, going to a working line would help a show line or vice versa. I can uh, add an example. 
Sure, I can add an example in there. Um, I have a fair number of Siberian Husky breeders and their sled dog line versus their show dog line, um, in many cases, they look like a, a, a totally separate breed of dog, uh, but they also use a lot of their show dogs as sled dogs in their teams of six or eight. Uh, and what they will many times do is um, they will breed both uh, particular types of dogs and get the benefits on both sides of the picture. Interesting. Zach, do you want to wrap that up? Does this have something to do with the COI you're going to talk to us about again? Uh, they, they definitely, so it's actually COI with um, the working and show lines in particular. Uh, often, you know, Embark will show you like this is the distribution of COI within your breed. And sometimes you see these sort of two little bumps. Um, so like, Greyhounds, I think, are an example where you've got like racing lines and show lines that have like different COIs because they've been bred like out and apart and bred different ways. Um, so yeah, there's there's definitely um, genetic differences for sure between these lines. Um, and yeah, I think that's probably all I've got there. Well, I know that uh, Lisa just had a recent litter and and discovered some interesting things about her COI. Uh, Lisa, you want to tell us about that since we're somewhat related in this topic? Sure, absolutely. So um, as a lot of my friends know, I hadn't had a litter in 15 years. So I felt like I was breeding for the first time almost. And I had, uh, you know, DNA tested uh, Polo, the, the, um, the mother of this litter, and her COI was around 13%. And I also used frozen semen, so I didn't quite have COI yet, but um, I was able to get a DNA profile on the frozen semen afterwards using the empty syringe, and Bark was able to get a DNA profile out of that, which was kind of cool. And his uh, COI was at 19%. So I had the, the mother at 13, the father at 19%, and my litter came out with COIs of anywhere between 24 and 29%. And it was an eye opener for me because like Zach was saying earlier, you know, you can have two dogs of zero COI and breed them together and, and get a much higher um, COI than you expected. Uh, so th that was a real eye opener for me to be able to use genetic COI and how, you know, thorough it is looking at the individual dogs. Um, I don't think I would breed another litter without doing that. Uh, Embark does have a, a service, a free consultation service that if you do have uh, two dogs tested, with Embark, uh, we can do a projected litter COI for you through customer service. And we also have a new product called Pair Predictor, which offers that instantaneously in your My Embark dashboard for about 60 breeds that we have right now. So, you know, as a breeder, I can't emphasize how much um, COI is important to things like the longevity of dogs. Uh, studies have shown that uh, the lower the CO, I'm sorry, the higher the COI, the shorter the lifespan of the dog can be up to two to three years shorter. The higher the COI goes, as much as like 10% jump in COI, you're going to lose two to three years life of the dog. It'll also show that a higher COI will give you smaller litters. And it will also show you that a higher COI will start to have a smaller body size for the individual dogs. And I know from breeding 35 years ago that I have experienced that. I've seen smaller litters. I've seen smaller dogs. Um, I can't talk about the longevity factor because unfortunately all my dogs have passed away from cancer at different ages. Um, so, but anyway, it is very important COI, genetic COI. I highly recommend it as a, as a breeding tool. It's one tool in your toolkit um, along with phenotype health testing and also other genetic health testing as well. Okay, we have another question. Um, this is a general embark question. Do you partner with rescue organizations uh, to get samples for research? And I think this means, you know, rescue, large rescue uh, organizations across the U.S. Zach, Dee, or Lisa, can you answer if embark does that? see if, if Lisa had better context than I do. I know that we we have some programs in place, but I don't have a lot of details about them on my end. I'm wondering if Lisa does. Yeah, I'm pretty much in the breeder world, but I know that Embark has partnered with research organizations in the in the past uh, for certain campaigns, such as Clear the Shelters and other things, but I don't have uh, a lot of knowledge about that. 
Well, related to that, let me just throw out a question. What about the designer briefs that are being bred that aren't having health screenings done before the breeding? Um, the breeders are not do investing in those dogs. Um, does are there any genetic related tests that Embark does that would be helpful um, in that area? Or, or have you already studied any of those designer breeds and found um, any, you know, discoveries? So I can answer that question. Um, Embark does, um, there are a fair, num fair number of breeders who, can you hear my dogs? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, okay. <laughs> their, their timing is impeccable, right? Uh, for the designer dog breeders, uh, Embark will give you the uh, breed-specific test results um, on the, the breeds, if there are two breeds, if it's a, a golden retriever and a poodle. Uh, it does list all the breed-specific um, health tests for both of those breeds. Um, you know, I think it's important, regardless of what kind of dogs you breed, that having genetic health testing is going to help create a healthier dog, certainly. So, um, for that, and also Pair Predictor offers eight designer mixes as well to check out the, um, the COI as well as the health conditions as well. So, yeah, it, it doesn't really matter what the dog is because the, the genetic health test will give you all the information that you need. All right, so now I'm going to go to Larry. Larry, as a vet and breeder, um, what else or what can you... Um, breeders that they could do, you think they could do to help bridge this breeding and science um, connection that we're trying to do. We're trying to help scientists. We want breeders to help scientists. Can, is there any, um, any words of wisdom that you can give them in this area? Um, the most important thing is learning about their breed, um, making sure that they know everything before they're breeding. Um, I'd like to say a little bit about the designer uh, breeds that you had just talked about. It's been a challenge uh, on those people breeding those dogs that we have to continually educate, 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 educate. I know that's a word that uh, you know we, we just kind of throw out there. As you say, a lot of them are not doing the health testing. Um, and they're just breeding dogs to, to, to breed dogs. And it's been a challenge in order to um, educate them. In fact, they take a longer period of time many times in order to get that. But I will say that some of them are actually getting with the program, uh, simply put. And uh, I just need to spend as much time in getting them trained up as my regular breeders, uh, you know, purebred breeders, if it is going to be something that we see. To be honest with you, probably... Uh, Somewhere between uh, 50 to 60 percent of all new puppies coming into my clinic are designer breeds. Uh, so it is here to it is here and it is here to stay. And we have to offer them the same services that we do everyone else. But it's important that they do understand that not just because you have uh, they may not even a lot of them say, well, they come in and tell me it's a healthier dog because it's a, it's a mixed breed of dog. That's not necessarily the case. I've seen all the same. Uh, health disorders that I see in a purebred dog in the doodle uh, or in a designer breed. And it's just important that the individual be given the same amount of time and we educate them extremely well because uh, many times they're not understanding uh, what they're doing. That's a great point, Larry. You know, I mean, everyone as a breeder started out with their first litter and you know, we didn't know what we were doing. So, you know, an education along the way is, is very helpful. There are a lot of great resources out there to learn about uh, genetic health as well as other types of health. I mean, even the OFA website is a great resource to show you what types of tests the parent clubs recommend for each breed. And, you know, if you are breeding designer uh, dogs, then you really need to go and look at what breeds are in your mix and, you know, adhere to the tests for both of those breeds. Well, here's, here's a question coming in um, about testing and breeding, so let me throw this to the group. There are a lot of breeders that do not believe in health testing. They claim it's too expensive. I know there are, are breeder litter kits. However, will Embark ever remove the limitation of buying the litter kit? But it can only be for that one litter. Some of us would love to stock up. However, we can't predict our litter sizes. 
So I can answer that. Um, you can purchase regular standard kits um, in tiered pricing. Uh, you can buy one kit, you can buy two to 10 or 10 to 20. So there is a tiered pricing model for uh, people to use um, if they want to stock up on kits that aren't specific to their litters. Great. And I think going to customer service would also be helpful. <laughs> Any other questions about that? Plan. Okay, we have another breeder. Let's see. As a breeder, what can we do or say beyond health testing, showing and working our dogs to prove to vets that we are good breeders? I've had a number of negative experiences with vets who just don't want to hear that we can be responsible breeders. Not everything needs to be or has to be a rescue. So this is something that's been ongoing in our um, world for a long time is that uh, and maybe it comes from uh, the school, vet schools, I'm not sure, but it seems like a lot of vets, um, breeder, to a lot of vets, breeder is a bad word. Does anyone want to jump on that? Um, Larry, in veterinary you school. Position, Larry, why don't you jump on that? Yeah. Um, in veterinary school, um, you learn a lot about breeding dogs, but it's not the top priority. We learn um, much more about the individual dog and the, the, the amount of time we actually spend talking about dog breeding is very small. Um, the good thing that's come along recently though is that um, AKC and some of the other people like Westminster have come along and they've started um, you know, doing a lot more programs with, with uh, getting more veterinarians that are interested in, in becoming breeder veterinarians or theriogenologists, which is the study of um, reproduction in dogs. Uh, donating to those causes is also helpful. But um, what I tell people uh, is, uh, you know, talk to, to other breeders uh, and find a breeder veterinarian. Um, there are a lot of us out there uh, that, you know, we have the passion for breeding dogs and we want to spend the time educating and helping. Um, go seek out from other breeders and talk to them um, and find a breeder veterinarian. Um, there are, and then if there's a, a, a veterinarian that doesn't want um, to deal with your breeding aspects or deal with breeders, you know, move on. Uh, you know, it's just like you finding a new dentist, a new doctor or anything like that. That's right. All right. That wraps it up, Larry. I'm going to have to uh, stop there. I want to thank all of our esteemed panelists for another great discussion. It's part of the Canine Health Summit powered by Embark Veterinary. John, I believe, is going to be joining us again to sign off, but I just wanted to thank you all for this great discussion. That's right. That's right. Thank you again very much to everyone, um, Gail, Larry, Lisa, and Zach. Um, a very important topic. Obviously, collaboration between breeders, veterinarians, and researchers is crucial to improve the overall care of dogs. So thank you again very much to each of you for their contributions in this area or your contributions in this area. Um, for all of our viewers, real fast, I have an announcement to follow up on a comment that Lisa made during the panel, um, which is that over the last day and a half, many attendees have posted requests about Embark to conduct research into various topics. We now have a request form posted in the Embark booth under the booth rep chat button, where you can provide more details about your request. And these are gonna be brought in and reviewed by our scientific team. So we would love to hear from you and we hope to take action on your research requests as much as possible. So please fill out this form. Again, it's in the lobby uh, or via the lobby, click on the Embark booth and then click on the booth rep chat button. Um, as for the rest of our health summit and the upcoming presentations, there are two to choose from. First, a presentation by Carlos Alvarez on the genetics of problem behaviors in dogs. And the other option, a presentation by Hilly Featon on canine copper storage disease. So we will look for you in those two presentations. And thank you again for your participation here.